my real pleasure uh, to welcome to DCDC, Zach Mensah. Uh, Zach is the CEO, uh, co-CEO of the Birmingham Museums Trust. Um, I, I suspect that the vast majority of us on this, on this um, call today will have been to one of the Museum Trust's um, uh, many um, uh, properties and, and venues. Uh, the Trust is responsible for nine venues um, within Birmingham from the City Centre Museum and Art Gallery and the Science Museum onto uh, a series of historic houses and then an exploration of Birmingham's working life through the Sharehold Mill and the Museum of Jewellery uh, <laughs> uh, Zach's going to be talking with us uh, about transformation and asking a deep question about whether the pandemic has changed how we think about transformation. So Zach, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, David. Firstly, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, we can see that. Thanks. Sir. So the first thing I'd like to say is for those of you um, who don't know me, as David mentioned, I'm co-CEO of Birmingham Museums Trust, which means um, the news of the co part is our first piece of transformation, which is to say that I'm a job share. And I'm fortunate to be a job share partner with uh, Sarah Wajid, who came from Museum of London. And we wanted to kick off our transformation by doing something that isn't commonly done. In fact, it's very rare um, in the creative sector for people to do a job share at the top level. So that's um, something that I wanted to share because I think it's a model that others could be doing. So I implore others to, to look at that. Before working here at the Trust, I spent six, seven years working for Bristol City Council as Head of Transformation. And I had the pleasure to work with museums, archives, arts development and filming across the city. So I've got a really good um, experience in this area. And before that, I've worked for, for JISC, being hosted by the University of Bristol. And I've also worked at Leicester in staff development. So I have a real affinity for, for those of you who are in the further and higher education sector as well as archives. So I've got a little bit of experience in all of them and I made the fatal mistake on my first day at the archives in Bristol about trying to take a cup of coffee into an archive room which I quickly learned is not the thing to do. So the Trust has a, a, about just over 120 staff and we have running costs of £28,000 a day. The reason why I wanted to mention the running costs is because I think it's quite important for us all sometimes to look at breaking down some of the uh, realities for us about how we run our organisations. And I'm always surprised that very few people understand how much it costs per day. And the reason for me why, of course, that's useful is in part to then understand how we how much money we need to find. And so it's a really useful uh, way for me to understand that. Of course. When the pandemic hit, Birmingham Museums Trust lost 95% of its income overnight, which tragically lost us not only 25% of people, but also meant that we lost expertise. And it's something that for all of us, whether you're, you're across the glamour sector, that is a real challenge, is not only losing people short term, but the fact that you're going to be losing expertise potentially for, for a whole generation, because once those skills disappear, they take a long time to come back. And that's something that we've got to be looking at addressing as part of our part of our recovery. Of course, being 25% smaller and yet trying to deliver all the things we want to deliver is one of our first challenges. Now on the screen at the moment, these are purposely small, but we'll be sharing the slides afterwards, is this is the 113 services, the public facing services I might add, that we as BMT say that we offer. However, one of my questions, of course, is how is it possible to run these services if A, we're 25% smaller, and B, are these the services that we need now and in the future? Because of course the pandemic has really led to us to think about massive change in all areas. And what's interesting with these services is we found that it's actually difficult to put these services together and there's lots of crossover, there's opportunity, but there's also kind of, I always think of it as a tectonic plates meeting when you're um, trying to run 113 services, B, 
because it's really difficult to negotiate the use of resource for the public when you've got all those competing priorities. So in my summary uh, of the, the, the talk in the description, sorry, I talked about this idea of being new. And the reason I mentioned that is it feels very much that the pandemic has changed fundamentally how we need to deliver our services. But before we had the pandemic, I would say that there's been quite a lot of slow chipping away anyway at what the value of some of the work that we offer in the sector is. So just from in, in museums, in this case, because museums are, are, are my background rather than, than libraries, is to explain that for many traditional museums, their traditional core is about preservation, storage, research and display. And in this hierarchy, the visitors are often secondary and that the wider social purposes are usually very small scale projects. And it's interesting, I'll talk about this a bit later, that this wasn't actually the original purpose of the museum. And it's often when I talk to people in the sector, they'll talk about that our role as being to protect collections rather than talking about people or about stories, which I think is the more root and branch useful part of, for all of us, which we ever feel you're in, to be, to be focused on. I guess talk a little bit about that today. Now on the screen is the Three Horizons, where the central idea of Three Horizons and what makes it so useful is that it draws our attention to the fact that there are three horizons that are always existing in the present moment. So the first horizon, which is the, uh, the, the curve in red, is a dominant system at present. So that's kind of represents business as usual. And we traditionally rely on these systems as being stable. Uh, but of course, as the world changes, the business may change. However, we may not have changed. And so there's a fundamental question I have around, are we fit for purpose? And of course, the pandemic has just brought that to laser-like into focus. Then the third horizon, which is the long-term successor and is the chart, uh, the curve, sorry, in the green, is talking about where things will be going to next. And then the second curve in blue represents this kind of transition. And this is the part I'm always really interested in. This is the, the transformation part around how some of the innovations that we're experiencing the last 12 months and probably the next year or so will, will eventually lead to improvements or maybe used to try and prop up the old model. So what's really interesting for me is to think about these things all at the same time. Because I think too often we try and talk about having to make transformation as if the other two aren't happening at the same time, which of course is not the case. I think as well that it's easy for us to assume then that the current model, it feels, sorry, as if the current model right now is, is broken and we need to change that. But I'm not actually so sure that just because some of the things have been slowly um, failing for us or not being as, um, as successful as we'd like, that it automatically means that the new thing will come in and sweep, to, sweep away the old stuff. I get to talk about that again a little bit later. So in terms of visual pictorial thoughts of those, that chart versus how I think about it, it's almost like thinking about a, it felt certainly the last 12 months that we were down a coal mine and we were really struggling. And our job now is to look at being smart about how we rebuild. And in this example, the pieces of wood are called pit props. And these are used to ensure that the mines, of course, don't collapse. And what we're in the position of now, and these three pictures to me, it's almost like a visual representation of the three horizons chart, is an opportunity for us to build something new, knowing that we can't go back to how things were. And actually, this is a bit of a crap joke, there is hopefully light at the end of the tunnel. 
So our current business model, in our case, has been designed pretty much for an old way of doing things that hasn't changed. And I think the last 12 months have really rattled us in terms of, I mentioned at the beginning, us losing 20, so 95% of our income overnight, because ultimately we weren't designed in a way to survive such a shock to the system in a short, uh, short space of time. And if you were to go back to the late 1800s when the museums first opened, and I'm sure it's very similar for, um, for libraries and archives, is things haven't shifted that much. People still care for the collection and there is still a place to visit. So things wouldn't look too dissimilar from uh, for that 100 plus year period of time. And so these figures are, are before the pandemic, but one of the things I'm now really interested in is with the pandemic affecting so many things for us all is what's left. So the average uh, family, according to the Office of National Statistics, has uh, a, day, a, a weekly spend of approximately £587 a week. And the majority of leisure time for, for both uh, for men and women, they, they distinguish in the charts around um, men and women, is that actually the most amount of time is spent consuming mass media. So watching TV, reading um, or listening to music between 14 and 16 hours a week. And the reason I mention that is in terms of if people have limited leisure time, how they choose to use our services in the sector is partly been predicated on understanding both how much time people have available, but also how much money they have. And now the money may not be because our services are often free at the point of entry, but there's often a cost in addition to time of people getting to our locations and perhaps in, in, in engaging with our, our, our services. And there often comes a cost to that. So for me, it's really helpful in terms of how we look at the, 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 the things going forward is to understand the kind of constraints of the people who might be using us. Also, and this is again pre-pandemic, and what I wanted to do here is link this idea that COVID has accelerated a number of things is that we've had, a, in our particular case, a 29% reduction in real terms of our public spending since 2014. Now, there is some wiggle room with that. In particular, in this case, the Arts Council, they actually had more, um, we could have bid for more money, but it turns out that for whatever reason, various reasons, our proposition ultimately was not seen as being um, as investable. And so we secured less money than we would have liked to have done. So what was really interesting there is even before the pandemic, the signs were there that perhaps some of what we offered perhaps wasn't in the direction of travel that it perhaps needed to be. And it would be sensible at this point as well, just to very briefly explain the funding situation, because of course the funding situation does partly predicate what we are able to do as an organization. So roughly 50% of our income is from public funding and then the other 50% is from things like ticket sales, memberships, conference hires, school bookings, etc. And because this has been done at the time when, as our funding was reducing, we sought to become more commercial. However, becoming more commercial it turns out in the pandemic um, has its pitfalls in that we weren't able to do any of these things. I'm sure it's the same for many of you as well. But what's actually fascinating about the, 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 our expenditure, about £10 million a year service, is that when you look at the non-staff costs, we're spending 60% of our money just to run the buildings, that's utilities and running costs, as well as repairs and maintenance. We only actually have, we're spending 4% of our activity directly on museum activity, which for a museum service to be spending only 4% of your total budget on actually doing the things the public want, to me is a real risk and shows that we need to, to change as part of our transformation, that surely the number should be almost never probably will be quite flipped the other way around, but flips so that 
we are all investing and spending as much money as possible actually on the activities for the public rather than sadly having to just almost act as a building uh, facilities manager. Also during the pandemic, one of the things as we all know from the four stage uh, roadmap from the government is that at step two, libraries and community centers were able to, to reopen because they were seen as being critical to the so part of the fabric of society and, and public good. Where I was really disappointed to, to realize that museums were put into step three and treated as indoor entertainment. So when you look at step three and you look at the, the detailed guidance, it talks about museums being seen as purely uh, tourist attractions in effect. And one of the rationales for putting museums into step three is that they were saying that because the global restrictions have hit airlines and particularly you know, cruise ships and other, that they thought that it was the international travel market who clearly were the market for museums. And this may be true for London, of course, and London's biggest museums, galleries and archives, but actually the majority of our museums and our activity on this, this session today are people who are actually based in, in their communities. So as an example, Birmingham and mostly Bristol, only 10% of our visitor figure was in the international market. And what it shows to me is that we as a sector haven't done a good enough job that why is it the case we're seeing entertainment? And I think that there's been a fundamental uh, loss of confidence in us in the sector at being able to clearly articulate to, to government and other, you know, other stakeholders then that museums in this particular case are more than just indoor entertainment are actually really critical often to um, to local community. So I wanted to make that point because I think it's really important for us to just have a think. And I know libraries, for example, although in step two, public libraries have seen real drop in uh, investment. And a figure I saw from SILIP had said that like public libraries have lost approximately 30% of their investment in the last um, 10 years and we all know many cases of cities considering shutting many of their um, their libraries. So there's clearly a disconnect about how we see ourselves as being really part of the community to being seen as something different by um, by certainly part of the, uh, the establishment. So part of the work we need to be doing in the next couple of years is rebuilding our confidence and it's showing through particularly COVID recovery, how we're all really vital actually to, to, to society. One of the things that I'm really struck by as well is again, in terms of wanting to look at how we can continue to make our, our sector better, is that the culture sector has structural inequality and there's a really uh, good book by Brooke O'Brien and Taylor called Culture is Bad for You, that really talks about and goes through the data that hones in on this idea of class, gender and race are unequally represented, both in the curation and consumption of culture. So who we all are in the sector is not representative of class, uh, gender and race, and nor are the people who have visited us. And there's been little real impact in the past 40 years, despite efforts of the sector wing to change. So we've all talked about changing and on an individual basis, sometimes have been successful. But as a sector, ultimately, we've had little ability to really change both the curation and consumption of that. And by creation, I mean workforce, I mean who we partner with in order to deliver our services. Interestingly, Birmingham has a unique opportunity due to our demographic compared to others. So that's something that we'll be exploring in the coming years. And so I mentioned some of the things that COVID has accelerated, you know, forced experiments, including working from home, um, and the fact that our economic models clearly don't seem to work, that there is an appetite for the types of community and local. And so if COVID has accelerated some of these things, 
this will help us to better understand how we can improve in the near future. So fortunately, it seems, you know, particularly in the UK, that we'll be able to have people visiting our sites very, very uh, soon. Well, at least gives us some confidence compared to, for example, in, in the museum world, the people who relied on international travel. Also, and I'll show us a chart in a minute, is some of the things that fundamentally shifted, such as people's ability to use online. And we all know a lot about how remote working and doing things differently has happened. Now, there's lots of issues with being forced to do things rather than choosing to do them. But at least now we know that there is other ways of doing things. And of course, we need to be really, really cognizant of the fact that as the um, as in the next few years, the government will no doubt seek to reduce its spend. And that's obviously a massive challenge. I gave an example of us being 50% public funding. So we now already know that there's going to be pressure on our budgets into the near future. But one of the things that COVID has done for us all as is basically shown as well that we used to focus quite heavily on in-person um, activity. And actually it turns out that when everyone gets online, there's lots that can be done. And we've all been proving in the last sort of 12 to 16 months that there is an appetite for people to do things differently. And I say this as someone who's got a digital um, background, that it still feels very much that we treat the in-person visits to our to our sector as being really important. But actually part of a large part of that is purely because our business model dictates that in-person visit. So now that people can be online, what's really interesting is since records began in 2006, where just over half the population had access to the internet, in February 2020, um, again, stats from the ONS, actually 96% of households in Great Britain have access to the internet. Now, that doesn't mean everyone has access, not everyone has devices. There's lots of digital literacy issues and, and the equalities from in-person have also been happening online. But with everyone online, it does make some interesting choices for us in our future. I know, for example, with libraries, particularly learning man uh, library management systems um, and archive world, the continued success of things like Ancestry show us that as we ebb towards the future, technology can help us do some of those things in interesting ways. I mean, maybe that this is a great way for us to reduce the, the scarcity that our physical spaces offer. That's just one example of how things have changed. One thing I'm really interested in for us in the sector is that the spike to the right hand side of this chart shows us that the percentage of total retail sales in the UK reached about 40, just under 40%. And that number is actually sticking this year. So there's been a fundamental huge spike in people who have now got used to the idea of using the internet to buy things. And I think that has a real interest going back to my 113 services earlier for us to think about actually how can we become perhaps digital by default in a lot of the services that we offer and it may long term be that our physical spaces um, are less of a priority in some ways than us being able to extend the scope scale and speed of us being able to use technology in the sector to access at least some of our services Quite often I've talked about people using digital purely for advertising and marketing rather than actually offering services in them of themselves. Also, a long-term trend in terms of, it felt like COVID had accelerated this, but it's been around for a long time, is that if you look at the chart, what really interests me are the two lines just from the bottom. So the orange, and I'm going to call it a light green um, colour that shows you people under 34 are using year on year less and less watching live broadcast television. And instead, they're using uh, streaming to do other services. Again, TV is traditionally a bit expensive for us, but it shows that 
there's a gap. If people are watching less television, live, live television, that things that are recorded, things that are online, now have even more of an opportunity than before. And it's something for us to be thinking about long term as we build our services back to being something different. Also, COVID has accelerated a number of things, particularly useful for us all, I think, our idea of digital wallets, something like 65% drop in the use of cash in the last um, eight, 16 months. That's really significant for us to understand, making sure that we are all thinking about having a digital means to access our, uh, our services, which before cash often made that very prohibitive for us. Now, again, there are inequalities. Not everyone has access to digital their means, debit cards, etc. And so we have to be careful whatever we do, because digital just can always go forward, that we don't leave people behind. Because I think there's a big, a big gap um, for us to be aware of, particularly as we talk about working with everyone in our communities. Automation is also something that's been happening more and more. And we won't talk about it today, but I think there's something really fascinating about machine learning and how that will help us all to deliver our services in ways we can't even think of right now over the next 50 or so years. So these things are, I'm not saying are things that are gonna be hugely important for us today right now, but because we're all in the business of keeping things in perpetuity, so museums, archives, you know, we're designing and libraries, we, we, we plan to try and keep things um, forever. It's really important that we able to take that long-term view and think about how some of these things can be used for us in a positive way. And because we're having to build things differently anyway, now is a good time for us to be considering that. At the moment, our service is having a look at a fundamental uh, root and branch change to organisation to make sure that it's fit for purpose for the future. So we've been working with uh, museum studies uh, University of, of Leicester with um, Professor Susan McLeod and Richard, Professor Richard Sandel, Sandel. And one of the things that me really makes think about is in order for us to do some of the new things, we need to let go of a whole bunch of things as well. So in this process so far, one of the things that's been really interesting for us all is we keep saying that we want to do more things to be social, if we do that, it disrupts our business model. However, there's no evidence that this is the case. Inclusive transformation actually demands of us all to think about new and creative ways to approach funding. So if we know that our public funding is decreasing, we know that making money commercially is difficult. We have to think about those things as being uh, aligned to each other rather than being in competition. And of course, it takes a long time to do this. But we have to confront this challenge um, in order for us to, to be successful rather than just pining about returning to an increase in public subsidy. Because sadly, I just don't think that's going to be a reality. I don't think, you know, whichever government it is feels that they can afford that, which comes back to this argument that we all need to be making long term about demonstrating the value of us. Also, now more than ever, probably feels like a time for people to be hunkering back down and, you know, serving the people who we, who we really serve well. And actually, one of the things that came out of the sessions is this idea of having core audiences and other is actually deeply unhelpful. And actually now is a moment of reset and that's letting go of trying to assume that we should just be focusing on, on the common audience. So in the case in the, in the museum sector, this data comes across you know, time and time again, particularly from the data that Arts Council has been collecting, is that museums typically super serve the uh, white middle class audience. And we have been talking about trying to do things that other communities often do very small you know, outreach programs. But of course, all they're really doing is continuing to prop up that old model. And so again, now more than ever, we should be thinking about the long term and talking about that, that shift rather than talking about it being a case of hunkering back to what we know works well for us because what works well for us actually hasn't really been working well for us 
when you look behind the, the curtains for quite some time. Another thing we need to, to um, let go of is this idea that, you know, we should be ensuring that public spaces are for everyone. And so that working more and more with our underrepresented groups can actually help generate a new improved future for us. I think there's lots of discussions we won't have time to get into today around you know, who's, whose history we're talking about anyway. And because there are so many people that are, are, are different, um, from different communities all over the world, different world views, now is a really good time for us to actually dive into that more, even though it feels uh, there's pressure for us to do things perhaps different. Also, a key challenge is learning that one of our roles is to help people value the idea of difference, and that there's diversity in all, all the services that we have to offer in the service. And so we shouldn't be ignoring those differences. We should be really finding ways to uh, identify and show these differences and explain them. It's our, our, our role as people who are experts in understanding the past, the present, and looking into the future to really take this time now to, to put that back at the top of our agenda rather than it feels a little bit like now's a scary time for us to be doing that. But if we don't do it, who will do that? So in terms of how things have been changing, it's also important for us to think about them. So if our funding has been slowly decreasing, if people are using you know, technology more and more, um, then where does that leave us now? Particularly with, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, a reduction in workforce, or traditional workforce, sorry, what is, is for, us, for us to change? I think the first thing for us all is probably to acknowledge that we are, we need to change our strategy. And at the museum, and I'm sure it's the same in your organizations, we, it definitely feels that we're all in serious trouble, depending on your funding model, uh, due to COVID-19. And so by acknowledging that, we're able to say, actually, we're in turnaround mode and you can, you can Google you know, typical business uh, information to, to find this. But turnaround is basically you acknowledge that we're in serious trouble. It's about having to re-energize, demoralize workforce. I mentioned the fact that not only have we lost 25% of our workforce, people are losing, leaving the sector, jobs have been precarious. Um, it feels this the shock from the you know, global health emergency has really, really knocked us on the floor. And I think it's important to actually acknowledge that rather than trying to say it's back to business as usual, particularly with the easing of, of lockdown expected you know, in, in the coming weeks. It could easily feel like just going back to how things used to be. I don't feel that we're going to realise some of the shock for a little while. We all had to make things well, decisions in the recent months and the near future under time pressure. So more than ever, we're having to, to make decisions with incomplete information. We're also turning around factors in about going deep enough with painful cuts now and difficult personnel choices because it's the right thing to do on us evolving and changing rather than just trying to go back to how things used to be. And a key thing for, the, for all of this turnaround mode is properly understanding and recognising that change is necessary. If we say it for everyone, then we need to make sure we actually put into play things that are about trying to make sure that we can contribute to wider society that also just happens to you know, contribute to the economy and that we have to acknowledge that. I think certainly in my organization right now, it feels that people are aware of the fact that we need to change for all sorts of reasons within the business model. However, actually saying it and doing it are really difficult. And I just want to acknowledge at this point in time, it's really, really difficult to be talking about some of the things I've been talking about so far this morning, and it has an impact on people. But a little bit of success can go a long way. So understanding we're in this situation is really important for us to look at this journey that we're going to be going on to, so we can move out of a turnaround sort of crisis mode, and then turn it into something which is more useful to more people. As an example on the screen now, Traditionally, we've looked at our organizations often in a very hierarchical approach. 
and it hasn't given us the change of flexibility and ability to be nimble that we'd like. So one of the things that we're looking at on the right hand side, you'll see that actually, if anything now more than ever, it's about us really understanding our mission and putting in place the infrastructure and experiences that people want, acknowledging as well our outside expertise that we need from others in the sector and putting the stakeholders closer together. The model on the left doesn't include that. It just talks about us, a very inward facing approach. I think it's really helpful for us all to start to look at other models of doing things that are more around um, shared, sharing power, co-production, and trying to get rid of some of the bureaucracy that we have as organizations. So I just want to show that a little bit bigger. And a model for this that's been done um, by others is it's a, a thing called sociocracy. It's used quite often by cooperatives and it allows us to potentially shift from being a model that's about us and to be one that places expertise both internal and external at the heart of an organization in order to deliver proper experiences and that are designed to be more inclusive for, for people. As an example of organizational change as well, we did a recent survey and 92% of our workforce talked about being supportive of some type of remote working, which is really, um, I'm really pleased to hear because I think asking people to come into work nine to five to stand up to be counselors, as it were, hasn't really changed since the industrial revolution and the work of Frederick Taylor, who was probably the, seen as the one of the first people to, uh, management gurus to look at how organizations can be run and things haven't really shifted um, beyond that so there's an opportunity for us if COVID forced experiment of, of asking us to do remote working happened and we know that it is possible um, what's key is that people are very interested in, in this idea of flexibility so all COVID did was say right we had to be at home we're now starting to get back to some sort of weird doesn't quite work hybrid, you know, versus being in the office. And so it should really be about any one of those individually. The interesting question then is not so much remote work, but how do we get things done? I think that's quite a fundamental difference um, than just thinking about, you know, people want to work at home or not work, want to work at home, because actually a good example would be we are now trying to look at being more asynchronous. So actually, do you need to have 90% of your meetings in a day, taking an hour, and you don't get work done? That's been a fundamental problem we've had since before the pandemic. I think the pandemic has now given us a glimpse, glimpse of being able to th consider to do things in a different way. And that's just really excites me. There's a very quick example about um, COVID acceleration. I'm really, excited about this idea the government last year fast-tracked his trial of e-scooters and this may give us in, in Birmingham's case we've got locations geographically dotted around the city but they've always been talked about guests and being difficult so I'm getting really interested about some of this new change around could things like e-scooters be one of the things that help us all get more people to visit our locations because it's it become easier if this sort of travel happens and so that's a kind of acceleration that I'm interested in that previously maybe it may have been another five ten years before we even looked at e-scooters being a, uh, one of the things that could potentially be useful for us in the sector. So where we are in terms of the big wave of change of course at the moment is if any of you are used to um, working in or digital technology this is the garden of hype cycle and Whenever something new comes along, a trigger, in this case, we'll call it the pandemic, but there's lots of things throughout the pandemic. It forces us to do things um, and everyone gets really excited. And then we get this really big drop and this trial of disillusionment. And it feels, as an example, that remote working, uh, home working, is that that right now? People are so fed up of it and they would rather go back to the office. But we're hoping that there'll be things that evolve and change that come through the cycle. So eventually we end up with something. It may not be Zoom, 
it may not be you know using live team schools but we're definitely in the moment somewhere in this hype cycle i suspect it's somewhere on the to, on the way of the towards the slope of enlightenment if we want it to be so i think now is a really good time for us all to think about how we can do things digitally um for, in service of our of our audiences and our colleagues rather than abandoning it at this point because i think that would be also a mistake so i say all the things i've said so far this morning to really go back to what we're here to do which of course is to do things with real people so one of the things i've been thinking about i can in consider you all to think about is wouldn't it be great if you thought about what would happen if you didn't need the money at this point in time and if you didn't need to worry about people coming through your doors or using your services, what would you do? Because I think it's really important for us, if we want to build uh, new, exciting things in the glam sector, if we took a second to stop worrying about the money and people, what would you do? I think that is a really interesting question for us. And I hope it gives you some inspiration to think about this. And so this is a, a quote from... Um, a person called Derek Sivers. And it certainly got me thinking throughout the pandemic around actually steadily worrying day to day about this 28,000 pounds a day running costs. What is my purpose? And I think for, for us at BMT as an example, it's about going back to the essence of being purpose led. So putting you know, our social ability and making us useful, which can help improve the lives of everyone who lives in the region and rebuild us from the bottom up. So based on our role in society being at the core and not thinking about us trying to do outreach as a marginal project or service. And this idea of us, I chose the example of circles rather than traditional hierarchy is how, you know, we've got big, we've got, we've got cumbersome. How can we go back to being less like that? And I think that the pandemic has given us this ability to think about this in new and different interesting ways. So when we look back at the original function of, of museums, and in this case, which is an example of, of Birmingham, they were actually originally designed to be, to be useful. They weren't designed for the elite. The art gallery was designed to attract ordinary people. It was also not devoted to this abstract idea of art for art's sake. It was designed to provide practical support for people in their everyday lives. William Morris, when he was president of the Birmingham Society of Arts, dismissed this idea of the you know, art for art's sake. And like the city's civic leaders, he believed that the purpose of art was to help make society better. In particular, he thought that art could help create what we would now call high quality jobs, jobs that are meaningful and satisfying and sustainable. And that's actually a key aim in the Midwest Midlands. And so it really got, got get, getting us to think about, actually, we all, we know that our, our organizations aren't just about pieces of paper, about storing objects, they're about people. And we know that we can help be part of this recovery, particularly more, now more than ever. And this idea of, of well-being and community is at the forefront. So it feels like a real opportunity for us to be grabbing this wave of change that which is people being available, people being um, often lonely and isolated and how we can help serve that. You know, at the, start, at the pandemic kicked off, again, stats from the ONS say that, you know, anxiety, I've certainly suffered personally from anxiety since the pandemic, has really spiked and people feeling less happy. That's something that museums, galleries, archives are, are able to particularly, you know, one of our raison d'etre is all about people therefore we can be part of helping to combat people's mental health issues and helping people with independence so it often affects older people vulnerable people and muse museums galleries archives our civic spaces our actual spaces are there as places that can help to combat some of these issues um you know loneliness apparently is equivalent to, uh, to equivalent, sorry, of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So we can help to combat some of these things and strive to be uh, useful to those people. 
to not just us, I'm sure hopefully lots of you in the room will be able to see that bring this all together is that this idea of social capital as a way of measuring the health of society, which at its heart is about social trust. Lots of times, lots of, there are lots of studies that say our sector is trusted quite highly. And so we have an opportunity to, to bring back civic pride and help reduce inequalities. Finally, a thing I wanted to mention as well is it's really difficult to think about changing lots of things. And so it's an interesting quote from Jeff Bezos that I, I, I regularly think about is what's not going to change in the next 10 years. And that is something that we all have an opportunity to think about deeply and then design our services to meet that, that particular need. And I won't play it now, but I've saved at the end of the slides the, the song that inspired me to think about the, how COVID, how the acceleration of the work we need to do, which is called um, I'm New Here by Jill Scott Heron, could um, be part of the solution. Because he talks about this idea we can go back, and I'm not sure we can go back to how things used to be. I'm not sure we want to go back to how things used to be. I think what we want to do is take what was good about the past, which was the glam sector's ability to have that social trust, to be places, civic spaces that can contribute to well-being of society and for us to go forth and make a ruckus. So at that point, I just wanted to say thank you and please do get in touch. I look forward to the uh, questions sessions now. So I'll hand back over to you. Um, Zach, thank you. That was um, incredible. It's so rich. I mean, there's um, there's uh, so many points there that could have been uh, a presentation in of themselves. I, I I I love the fact that you reminded us of the original purpose of of museums and that 19th century view that they were for you know the artisan classes and that they had, they they had that role. And you can see the same in the public library movement of the mid 19th century it had exactly the same sort of um, um, purpose to it. And I, I do sometimes feel that we've, we've lost some of that civic um, um, responsibility idea around our, our, our institutions. And just the difficulty that you highlighted of the, the tension between a, pol a politic that feels, especially in England at the moment, rather inward looking and constricting, and your view of the museum sector that should be more expansive and inclusive. I think that's going to be a difficult um, issue for, for people like you to, <laughs> to, to navigate. I think that we could have spent hours talking about what it's like having a job share at the level of CEO, but perhaps we won't go into, into that. And also the skills um, issue, that sort of exodus of skills uh, that we're seeing from the, from all of our sectors at the moment, I think is, is really fascinating. But I wanted to pick up, um, because it's, it's coming the questions, um, uh, I, I think the tension um, that we that you um, alluded to um, in in the presentation, uh, the, the the tensions and the thoughts about the um, the the balance between the physical and the digital, because uh, I think that came out very very strongly. I mean, one issue is is you spoke about a wider engagement and a need for wider engagement, but then you also touched upon um, digital poverty, and is there a danger there? Uh, this is my question, I guess. Is is there a danger there that we actually engender a, a, a new set of, of, of people who are dis in, 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 you know, dispossessed uh, or, or don't don't engage because of you know as we move into this digital world there is a significant number of people who, who don't have the resources and capability to, to, to engage yeah I think the you know, the first thing to acknowledge is by moving everything online despite the figure of 96 percent of people who have an internet, that's quite vague still. It's a misleading figure in of itself. Um, any, anyone who has kids last year in a pandemic, for example, when you were all stuck at home, your internet wasn't fast enough. You probably, if you were lucky, had one device between your whole family. Um, and so that immediately what, what you realise is that digital has almost you know, by accident just exacerbated the, the, the inequalities. So, you know, it's no different to the scarcity of physical spaces that's happened with the digital. So I think us acknowledging that is the first step. 
to us, wanted to change, you know. Um, so we, yes, we should do digital things, but we have to be cognizant all the time that not everyone has access and that do, being digitally assisted will be there forever. So again, our physical spaces can help that. You know, most of our spaces probably have free uh, Wi-Fi, for example. So rather than doing it, um, it almost, in fact, I'm not even sure why everyone has free Wi-Fi, right? So uh, the organizations, but there is a good purpose for it. And so what we should be doing is saying, actually, our civic spaces could be places to teach people how to use digital literacy skills and to have access to this, uh, the technology to use our services and others. Um, I don't think at the moment we think about Wi-Fi particularly in that way. We sort of say it's almost like a utility. We, we just stick it there because every museum, every library has public Wi-Fi. And we're not always necessarily thinking about how we can proactively use that. Even if you look at some of the stuff in the... Um, the banks, banking world, for example, because they are trying desperately to reduce the number of banks, they are trying to teach people how to use digital skills because their business model needs it. And so I'm not saying we should get rid of our museums and galleries and you know, libraries um, and go, go, go digital fully, but what we should be doing is understanding our built environment has a, has a, has a place to support the physical and the online. And so you're on mute, David. Um, because as we were talking about the problems of the digital, I dropped out for a few minutes because my internet connection was, was wasn't working. So sorry about that. But that that point about the 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 mix between the the, the physical and the digital is, is one that's been picked up in, in some of the questions as well. Um, so you know that question about community under the same community sense in a in a digital world that you can in with with people coming into a physical space and um, you know how how one might do that and if there are then issues around you know based on censorship and control and 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 and, and issues around that well, i think it's it's important for us so you cut out a little bit so i think i heard i think i heard your question um uh, fully um was is to understand that our physical spaces are really really important and can contribute to the wider um, you know, inequalities issues that we've got. And that it's just shifting slightly what some of our physical spaces are. So we've just talked about something in Birmingham around actually purposely having flexible spaces, having more seating in the last 20, 30 years, lots of you know, places have removed spaces to just spend time, um, which obviously is prohibitive in terms then of doing some interesting work. So I think, Historic properties and, and, and all of our, our, our assets are really important. And it's important to also acknowledge that people who are online are up there, they're still real people at the end of those screens. So it's not one or the other. It's about how can we serve people who you know, choose or aren't able to physically come to our spaces, as well as doing those interesting things in our, in our physical buildings. But I must also say that our buildings, are all, you know, our historic properties, certainly, they're all falling apart. There's a real lack, chronic lack of investment in our spaces. So sadly, I know our buildings may not survive another 100 years based on the current fact they're falling apart. And, and that raises an interesting question as well. You, you, you talked at one point about how you are almost a building facilities manager, you know, in having to maintain these historic, you know, I, I, I think of something like the, 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 the main gallery and, and museum in, in, in the centre of Birmingham, this sort of great Victorian building, which I imagine needs a lot of care and attention to keep it, uh, to keep it in, in, intact, but which may not be necessarily fit for the sorts of purposes that you're talking about as a 21st century museum and the tension there and is there a danger, do you think? I mean, it's, is, there, is there a danger that we might lose some of those historic buildings? Uh, you know, not, not specifically Birmingham, but, you know, no, across the UK. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. You know, there's no, just because they've been there for 100 plus years and people like them, they're actually also, for some people, very intimidating buildings. So weirdly, you've got this problem where there's some nostalgia, you know, around Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, very traditional, civic, beautiful museum. But... If it scares some people off, you know, is it has it run its course? Um, I'm not saying that it has. And converse to that, for example, very specifically, Birmingham Museum Art Gallery has had to close the next three years for some refurbishment works. So one of the things we're looking at is actually, do we need to put all the offices back in? Could we perhaps use some of those spaces for different uses? Is there better collaborations that we can have for people in the sector 
to do more interesting things rather than just go back to just you know, sticking bums on seats to type away at computer all day. So there's an opportunity in this very specific case to use our buildings differently, but they are literally crumbling as, you know, as we speak. Um, the issues around uh, mass media, yeah, mass media consumption that you touched on, uh, the, the question about how we might be able to take advantage of that more, and uh, if you had any thoughts about about that, about digital, you said sorry, is that so? I, and and the changing way in which people are consuming mass media and the opportunities that that might present. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many opportunities from the growth of digital. Every sector, you know, on the planet is seeing you know year on year growth around the use of that um you know one of my favorites is still you know ancestry i remember when ancestry wasn't you know wasn't widespread and there was real concern from everyone saying oh no because if you you if we put everything on ancestry people would visit our physical spaces when actually what it has done is there's a massive increase in people being interested in their family history in particular um and there's something about that about the future of like we're not quite sure to put a finger on it but we know there's a demand for our work um, you know, recently, um, the, the TV series, for example, House Through Time, that led to lots of people suddenly seeing an archive, being you know, really understanding what archives are for. And so, again, it's about us just trying to negotiate what the user need is. Let's just go back to, again, to the essence of what it is we're here to do and how do we super serve that.